Okay, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I really enjoyed um, reading this paper. Um, let me tell you what it's about. The paper is about quantifying um, the ways in which monetary policy affects bank lending. Um, so there are three channels that are very, you know, kind of um, studied in the literature. The paper is going to put those uh, three together and kind of run a horse race, if you will, between them. There's the old uh, reserves channel, the Bernanke and Blinder. Let me remind you how that works. It says, well, uh, reserves didn't use to pay an interest, so when you raise interest rates, uh, the cost of holding the reserves goes up. Deposits uh, require reserves, so if reserves are more expensive, you don't want as many deposits. Uh, deposits shrink, and there's less lending as a result of that. Uh, then there's kind of the bank capital or bank balance sheet channel that is kind of the spirit of Bernanke and Gertler. What that says is banks have a duration mismatch, long-term assets, short-term liabilities. So when you increase rates, that causes the assets to fall more than liabilities. The equity capital of the banks falls, and then if there's either a capital constraint or for some other reason capital is, is, is important, can't be issued, that's going to cause, again, banks to contract their balance sheet. Uh, the deposits channel uh, that I've uh, worked on um, is the newest of these, and uh, the way that one works is that uh, it recognizes the fact that banks have market power kind of over retail deposit markets. And what that does is it allows them to keep their, the rates that they pay on deposits low even when the Fed is raising rates. Um, so, you know, last few years, Fed's been raising rates. If you've checked your checking or savings account at the regular bank, if you have one, interest rate probably hasn't gone up very much. Um, some people, most people don't really respond to that. They leave their deposits in, but some people do. They'll take their deposits out, go into a money market fund or something else, and as a result of that, deposits tend to shrink, and to the extent that banks um, view deposits as a special source of funding, uh, it again leads to a contraction in lending. Okay, what this paper is going to do is something pretty ambitious. It's going to build an estimated dynamic model that's going to have all three channels in it, and it's doing that because it wants to quantify their impact. Um, uh, that's really important. It's necessary for policy relevance. So when you talk to people that work at the Fed, they're interested, but at the end of the day, they want to know how much should we care, and that depends on how big is this thing compared to all these other things. Okay, so that's what the paper is trying to do. It's a challenging thing to do. Um, what they find, uh, bottom line, is uh, that the deposit channel kind of has the largest effect um, on bank lending. It's followed by the bank capital channel. Um, and the reserve channel is kind of negligible and could be ignored. Uh, the paper also has some interesting results on the um, kind of non-monotonic response of lending uh, to policy rates uh, near the zero lower bound, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. I'll talk about that. Okay, just a quick kind of summary of what the deposit channel is about. Uh, as I mentioned, on the left here, uh, this red line is kind of the average deposit rate. Uh, the banks pay. Black line is the Fed funds rate. And what you see is that when the Fed funds rate is low, uh, deposits are fairly competitive. Their rates are not too far off uh, market rates. But then as the Fed starts raising rates, banks uh, barely raise their deposits rates, and so suddenly there's a big spread that opens up between deposits and market rates. The spread is big. It goes from like zero to you know, 400 basis points or something like that, and this is a $10 trillion asset class, so this is like a very large uh, dollar amounts talking, we're talking about. As I said, people, uh, some people do respond, such a deposit growth is very negatively correlated with the Fed funds rate. When Fed funds rate is increasing, deposit growth is dropping. When the Fed funds rate is decreasing, deposit growth is increasing. So um, that's um, um, the dynamic I was talking about earlier here, just in pictures. Um, and um, what we did in our paper is we went to the cross-section to, to, to try to quantify the effects here. And what we found using cross-sectional analysis is that a 100 basis point rate hike is associated with about a 3.5% uh, contraction in deposits and a 2.5% uh, roughly uh, contraction in the stock of loans on bank balance sheet. Um, the paper is going to estimate, um, num gets numbers that are uh, smaller, um, somewhat smaller, but still substantial. There's about a 1% contraction in deposits and a 0.56 contraction in the stock of loans. Now, that's still a pretty big number because uh, remember, loans have something like a four or five year maturity, and so to contract the stock of loans by 0.5%, the flow of new lending has to contract by over 2%. So, so just keep that in mind, stocks versus flows. And I'll get to, I think, the question of why the number is slightly different, even though they're, I think, somewhat comparable. Okay, what's the methodology? Um, as you find, I think, explained very well, um, they're going to estimate deposit and loan uh, demand curves using the BOP framework uh, with some instruments. Um, 
Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second, but this is just kind of giving you an overview. Then you're going to plug these demand curves into banks' profit maximization problem. Uh, of course, there are like thousands of banks out there, so dealing with thousands of banks is hard. They each are going to like react to each other's deposit rates, etc. What they do is they reduce to six representative banks, kind of for computational reasons, because of the strategic interaction. Uh, and I think that's actually pretty reasonable, first of all, because the distribution of bank size is extremely skewed. Uh, and second of all, because in most banking markets, kind of like at the MSA level, there's really, really are about five or six kind of banks with significant presence. Uh, so I don't think you lose too much from, from, from doing that simplification. Um, then they're going to use simulated methods of moments based on a time series VAR from the data in order to uh, discipline uh, some of the other moments in the model, such as wholesale funding, um, dividends, um, loan demand, et cetera. Now, the key challenge here, and I think this goes back to the issue where the numbers are a little bit different from the cross-sectional estimates, the key challenge here is that the, the VAR is, has an endogeneity problem, which is that the Fed tends to tighten precisely when the economy is booming. So the, the credit contraction you're going to estimate in the aggregate time series might be smaller than the causal impact of the tightening itself, uh, given that the tightening is responding to what otherwise would be strong credit growth. Um, and then they'll examine counterfactuals by moving, kind of removing uh, one mechanism uh, at a time. Um, it's interesting because the order matters given that they interact. Uh, so if you remove them all at a time or different orders, you could get different um, results. Okay, here's a little bit of, on the BOP uh, method. It was introduced, uh, for example, in the finance and the banking literature uh, by Gregor's work uh, with Hortakshu and Mark Egan. Um, you, wanna, you have the household demand for deposits, depends on the rate deposits are paying, then there's some observable characteristics and some unobservable characteristics like quality, et cetera. Uh, the challenge is that what we want is this elasticity, right? How much uh, are households going to respond to changes in the deposit rate, but we don't really observe the quality or kind of like this demand shock here. And so what they're going to do is try to instrument for the, um, for the rate. Um, so if you just regress on the rate, you, that, that's likely to be correlated with quality, but they're going to use an instrument for the rate uh, using the salaries and kind of the expense on fixed assets that the, that the bank is paying. So the, assem uh, the identification assumption is that uh, these expenses um, affect, the, um, affect deposit rates. If the expenses are higher, the deposit rate has to be lower for the bank to kind of break even, but that they're somehow independent of uh, these unobservable quality and demand um, characteristics. Um, of course, the concern is that um, actually paying more salaries or higher rents could improve the quality of deposits, right? Uh, maybe the bank branch provides better services, deposits are often bundled with other products, things like that. Uh, they might also be correlated with demand. For example, rents are very high in, in wealthier areas where there might be more de demand for deposits in general. So this is not a, a perfect instrument. Uh, but in, and in particular, what it does, I think, is that it makes um, it leads to a bias in this elasticity that, that, that towards zero so that um, uh, even as, so what you see in the data then is higher expenses, really the quality of deposits is going up and so households don't look like they're responding to the rate, but, the, but what's really happening is they are getting more uh, services or there's more demand. And so the elasticity is going to be biased towards zero. Um, there's definitely more controls that can be thrown in here. Um, for example, the paper could con looks, uh, control separately for the mix of deposits between checking, savings, and time deposits because these offer very different bundles of these services. I think that could get, go a long way towards kind of um, taking care of some of this. Uh, you could also run it in changes where a lot of these kind of constant characteristics are going to be uh, differenced out. Um, okay, uh, let me talk about the bank capital channel, which is uh, one of the important ones here. Um, this is a simple regression of uh, bank stock returns on uh, the Fed, on the monetary policy shock identified from Fed meetings. And um, it's separated between times when the Fed funds rate was high and when it was low. And what you get is kind of typical um, is a small negative number maybe in general. And the interesting thing here is it actually flips to positive when the, low Fed, when the Fed funds rate is low. Uh, I'll talk about that too, but let me just first start with the just baseline number and convince you that it's kind of small even in the high Fed funds rate environment. I think the paper explains why this is happening pretty well. Um, why is this? So this says uh, you raise the, the funds rate by 100 basis points, the bank stocks are only going to down by like 129 basis points. So it's kind of like one to one. And that's surprising because banks have a duration mismatch of four years and a leverage of 10. So a 1% increase in interest rate should reduce their equity by like 40% based on kind of textbook duration mismatch calculation. Uh, model does a good job of, not, of, of capturing the low number. The, the calibrated um, number they get is negative 2.8%. 
Um, and as a result of that, the, this is really why the bank capital channel doesn't have much of an impact on bank lending, only 0.4%. Imagine if equity went down by 40. Uh, that would be much more dramatic. Why is this happening? Well, it's happening precisely because even though there's this big duration mismatch, the rate that banks are paying on deposits looks nothing like the short-term rate. So when, in when interest rates uh, go up, if you were borrowing at the Fed funds rate, you would be getting squeezed um, all the time. Instead, banks are borrowing at this orange rate here, uh, which is lower and much less sensitive, and in fact tracks almost exactly the, in the rate they're earning on their assets, their income rate. And so banks are pretty well hedged respect to interest rate shocks, precisely because the sensitivity of the deposit rates is so low and the model captures this very well. Um, I, I like these results on the reversal rate, uh, if you will, as kind of Bruno Meyer and Kobe coined that term, um, which says that when rates are very low, there's a further decline. Uh, if you decline rates further, there are kind of two effects. There's the, the deposit effect, which says, okay, well, if rates are low, spreads are going to be tight, so a lot of deposits are going to flow in. That should be good for lending. But on the other hand, banks are becoming less profitable because they're, 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 they're um, being squeezed by the low rates between their assets and their um, deposits that they're paying. And so that, in the model, tightens uh, the capital constraint and causes loans to go down such that the net effect can be negative. Um, now, I think to remember is banks are holding long-term assets, so like I said, they're pretty well hedged. So if this is a short-lived shock, it's not really going to matter very much. They'll write it out because they'll still have long-term assets that are hedging that. But eventually those long-term assets roll off the balance sheet and then um, that runs out. And so it's going to hold for very persistent declines like Japan. And you really see Japanese banks being squeezed in, especially when you get to negative rates like in Europe. Um, and I would just say that this mechanism is actually much more general than the capital requirement. What we're basically saying is that because banks can't really, or to the extent that they can't uh, pay negative rates on deposits, um, th as you get to negative or, or near the zero lower bound or negative interest rates, you're really squeezing the profitability of the banking sector, and that's going to cause banks to pull back kind of no matter what, whether or not they have a capital requirement. They're just less profitable, right? Uh, you can model that. Um, it's not currently in the model as kind of an entry and exit decision of the banks, and I think that just means that this reversal rate type effect should be much more general. It's not really about the capital channel. Okay, as I said, the reserve channel can be ignored. The basic reason is because most deposits aren't reservable, uh, not to mention nowadays reserves pay interest. So uh, even on a priori grounds, I think that this one uh, wouldn't expect it to do much. Um, let me um, um, talk a little bit about um, the, um, the, uh, the overall effect. Um, you showed this picture. I think one of the things that's a little bit confusing is the total effect here is 1.5% decline in loans per 100 base points increase in, in rates. Um, what's a little bit confusing is just to make it clear to everyone is what they're doing is they're removing a channel at a time and then bringing it back in and removing another channel. So these are not cumulative here. And so, what you, so, so these are really the individual effects of each channel. And so you see that the reserve channel has almost no effect. The capital channel has some effect. The positive channel is somewhat bigger. And then the loan market power channel kind of goes in the, in the opposite direction. Okay, so the loan supply channels, kind of like these three, if you will, add up to about 71% of total impact. If you net out market power, maybe uh, 50% um, is, is explained. What's the rest? Uh, by the way, this decomposition is not unique because if you do different combinations of the fractions of the channels, given that they interact, you could get different decompositions, different numbers. Uh, but in any case, given this one, the other 50% or so is, is loan demand. It's saying that what high rates do is they just make firms not want to borrow very much. I just want to mention, and the, the paper's not very clear on this, um, loan demand, and because it, it's basically how much firms want to invest, depends on the real long-term rate. So both the word real and the word long-term is important here because what the Fed actually moves is the nominal short-term rate. Um, so what the, uh, the nominal rate, of course, is relevant for deposits, so that's totally right, because uh, it governs the opportunity cost of cash, right? So that's why for deposits, it's the nominal rate that matters. But for loan demand, um, which is pretty big here, it's the real rate that matters, and moreover, the real long-term rate. So to move loan demand, as is happening here, <clears throat> what the paper is doing is it's assuming a ton of price stickiness. In fact, I think they're treating the Fed funds rate as the, as the real rate. So it's kind of like perfect price stickiness, uh, one to one. And moreover, they're assuming that the monetary policy shocks are highly persistent in order to move the long-term rate by a lot. 
Now, if you look at the Fed funds rate, it is pretty persistent, at least at business cycle frequencies. But a lot of that is just kind of tracking the natural rate of the, uh, the so-called natural rate in the economy. The monetary policy shocks themselves are actually puzzlingly not that persistent when people try to estimate them. Uh, and so literature generally finds monetary policy shocks that are much less persistent. And so I think the loan demand channel might be overstated here, even though it's, it's kind of the residual. Um, but but it, it, I think the paper could be more explicit about the price stickiness it's assuming and the persistence of the shocks uh, to the real rate in particular. And in fact, the more ambitious thing, maybe a follow-on paper would be to literally em embed uh, this kind of bank um, interesting, uh, bank focused paper uh, into the more uh, textbook NK framework. And now you could compare not just different channels on bank lending, but also bank lending channels as a whole against textbook channels about uh, movements in, in the real rate. Okay, so just to conclude, I think it's a very nice, ambitious paper, really. Uh, it provides a tractable, dynamic model that can jointly capture all these uh, existing channels in a unified way. Um, deposits channel seems to be kind of um, doing the most, has the biggest impact. The bank capital channel is weak, mostly because banks are pretty well hedged with respect to interest rate shock reserves you can ignore. Um, and then there's this effect on prolonged near zero rates, which kind of drive banks into a uh, lack of profitability. So my challenge for the authors is if they could quantify now the transmission, not just to bank lending, but now given the transmission of bank lending, can we compare now to other non-bank channels for monetary policy and to see uh, that's really what central bankers really want to know. Um, and for that, you would need to really think hard about uh, price rigidities in order to discipline effects on the real rate. Thanks.